Fasting whenever you don't know what to do. Fasting when you don't know what to do. Now, this is the first of a new series. You say, Brother Michael, why are you preaching on fasting in the middle of July? What is this about preaching on fasting? And, well, what it is and what I'm after, the key word that, that I feel like God wants us to do, and I know because our country today is... is it's just it's confused it's store up there's so much stuff in that's going on and in uh, different kinds of protests and i'm all for uh, peaceful protests but not for law breaking uh, protests and people breaking the law and and so on and so forth and and people expressing their opinions but there's so much confusion today people don't even know how to respond or say they're afraid that they may say something wrong or it may come out wrong and today and we've got a lot of that and so as we go through this and my prayer for uh, this uh, series and the title for this whole series just four sermons and to not take your eyes off the mission the the title for the series is not so fast not so fast and basically kind of like one thing that a fast does is that uh, it causes us to do something that this COVID virus has definitely caused a lot of our country to do, and that is a lot of people have hit the pause button. They've literally hit the pause button and had to take a time, and that's what a fast is. Now, before I read verses 1 through 4 and just looking at this, and so basically too often people on a fast, they, we think of this, that fasting is only a lack of food. Instead, the purpose of fasting should be to take your eyes off the things of this world and focus completely on God, okay? Also, fasting is not intended to, to like, punish your flesh. Like, okay, brother, I'm going to fast from banana pudding and blue bell ice cream. That's what I'm going to fast from. I'm going to earn that one because I need to lose a few pounds or something like that and and, you know, that's not the idea, even though that's just called self-control or willpower. But again, not to punish the flesh, but to redirect attention to God. And uh, in this last week, I mentioned about praying for this. I'm going to challenge everybody in this room. I've already challenged the 9 o'clock crowd, and uh, I'm going to challenge you and challenge everybody that's watching by Facebook. And if you've already made up your mind, there's some people. I was visiting with Brother Ken Layton this week, and we was having a, a great visit. I believe it was yesterday. And he said, Brother Michael, I was paying attention. I listened to your sermon last week, and I heard you mention about praying about fasting. And, uh, and I heard you give some examples, and I've had it. No more news for me. That's the negativest stuff I've ever seen. No, I'm fasting from news. That's what, and he said, I don't know if it's one day a week or how long, but just be, I don't care if it's one hour, one hour, just one day this week, just one, I mean, there's seven days in a week, amen? So just pick one day and say, okay, I'm going to fast from social media. I'm going to fast from my phone. That'd be hard for a lot of people, fast from your phone, you know, and, uh, or social media or news. And then I, there was a word that I was thinking about mentioning it, and I lost it last week, but I got it in my notes this week. Busyness. Just, I mean, just busyness. And you say, well, is that biblical? Is that? Yeah, it's got a great psalm that says, be still and know that I am God. And I want to say this this morning. Did you know there's a big difference between being still and doing nothing? I mean, lots of people do nothing. But you can be still on purpose, you know. And I, and I remember the first time granddad taking me squirrel hunting and uh, sitting up against a tree and here come, you, you got to be still, okay? Be still. A lot of times I've been, uh, used to hunt a lot on national forest land and over in Texas it was called type two land and, uh, and I would hunt two or three miles in there and I didn't have a climbing stand to take in there. So I'd just go in there a few days before, find me a scrape, and find me a tree about 30 yards away from that scrape, go in there, sit down, be still, and guess what my chances were? And a lot of times I drug out a big old buck deer. Didn't have a four-wheeler drag it out. I had a rope, okay? That's how I drug the deer out of the woods, but I had to be real still. So there's a difference between doing nothing 
and being still. And God's Word tells us to hit the pause button sometimes. So you can fast from more than just food. And again, and, and again the purpose is not to punish yourself or say, well, I need to, to break a bad habit. That is not biblical fasting, okay? Not biblical fasting. Just because you're going to have a, uh, go to the doctor and the doctor says you can't eat or drink till after you see me and you do that kind of medical fast or something. I'm not talking, I'm talking about a spiritual fast where I consciously decide I'm going to do without, put this aside and give more time to prayer, God, or just a pause and say, just let me listen. Okay, just let me hear from him. Meditate on one verse. Pick a verse out. Pick a chapter out. Read a chapter and say, I'm going to do this for God. So we're going to look at that. And I'm, So just, again, I'm not asking you to go the whole month of July. I'm asking for four days in July. One day a week. To say, just to hit the pause button of something. And say, I'm going to concentrate... And why is Brother Michael doing this? Well, of all times in the United States, does our country need the Lord? Huh? Can I get an amen, a hello? Huh? Does our country need the Lord? It does. Our country needs Jesus. And, and, and in my notes, there's a sentence, and I want you to remember this. As go our churches, so goes our country. As go our churches, so and if our churches have lost their, their, even the desire, and again, to me, the key word for Sharon Missionary Baptist Church is are we desperate for God? Now, so many people have a casual relationship with Jesus. I mentioned this in the first service. It's not my notes. It's free. It's extra. And um, how many of you remember or ever have toted a rabbit's foot. Anybody ever owned one of them things? You know, right? Thing. Why would you want a dried up, uh, dead appendage in your pocket? Hmm? You know, on your keychain. Why would you want a dried up, dead uh, animal appendage in that furry? You know, you can get them with the fur on there. Why did we? Why did we even tote those things? Does anybody remember why did we tote them? Good luck. Good luck. Yeah, it was, and it's an old thing, been around. I don't know what people tote today, but guess what? And a lot of people want to treat church, God, and Jesus like a rabbit's foot. Let me just tote it, and when I need a little good luck, I'll take it out and rub it, and we treat Jesus that way. We're not desperate for Jesus. We just use him like a good luck charm. We just use him like a, just, well, I, I just need a little, need a little prayer, preacher, need a little prayer. And uh, so you just pull the rabbit's foot out for a little luck. You pull Jesus out when you need a little, well, I'm just not having a good day. Man, I just let a few words fly. Let me, Lord, I need a little help today. And we treat him just like a spare tire in the case of an emergency instead of something we use all the time like a steering wheel in the direction for our life. Let's read uh, Second Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 1. And it says this, Second Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 1, It happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with, uh, with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. And so there was a bunch of people coming against Judah and the king Jehoshaphat. And then some came and told Jehoshaphat, verse 2, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are in uh, Hazion Tamar, which is in, in Gedi. So that really scared uh, the bejeebers out of uh, Jehoshaphat. He's like, He's like, whoa, wait a second. That, they're right in our back door. They're, they're, the army's here. And it scared him. And they, he couldn't believe they were that close. Jehoshaphat, verse 3, uh, feared. Well, yeah, somebody's coming to kill you. And set himself to seek the Lord, proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And so Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Father, may you be honored with our church as we desperately seek you and to put aside stuff 
and get our eyes on you. In Jesus' name, amen. And so as we dive into this again, what is the purpose of a fast? And, and we see this call for a fast here, and, and why are they doing it? All the things that uh, has happened in our country. The, for 12 weeks, we did not meet inside the church. I'm glad for our freedom. Did you know our country is 244 years old as of yesterday? And I'm thankful that we have the freedom we do. But folks, we are one, not even one generation from losing our freedoms. Matter of fact, many of our freedoms are disappearing right before our eyes. Even during that 12 weeks, there were states and mayors and governors who were anti-church. You say, no, they weren't anti-church. Yeah, they were sending the police to, to shut down parking lot services in the name of safety. And I understand that. And again, I, I see where, you know, again, why should Brother Michael, and why is he feeling led to even preach on fasting? Because uh, again, the direction of our nation to pray for our leaders, to pray for our governor, to pray for our president, to pray for all those in, in law enforcement and our firemen, and we got firemen here, we got police here, and all of these things that are represented to pray for those in authority in leadership. And we need to be desperate for God, and that's what we see in our text. This is... By the way, a spiritual battle. It is. It's a spiritual battle this morning. Spir Did you know spiritual battles are not fought in a, in a boxing stance? Spiritual battles are not fought in an MMA stance. Spiritual battles are fought on our knees in a people who will give their hearts to Jesus. And a people who will be desperate for God. That's what we see in our text. And again, what is the title for this morning's message? Fasting when you don't know what to do. Fast, and have you ever been there? Have you ever been, and maybe you're right there right now. You don't know what to do. Uh, I see Miss Lori in here, and we have teachers that are represented here, and there's some on vacation, and rightfully so, because this fall is coming. I was asking Kelsey earlier, and she's going to work for Howard Perrin, and, 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 and I said, do, do, do you know your fall game plan yet? And she said, no. And a lot of teachers and coaches that are here and different things, and there's like, what is going to happen this fall? Think about that, and so much, it's not, we're not alone. Arkansas, Texas, we're not alone. You know, so what's the game plan? And a lot of times when we become desperate for God is when what? When we don't know what to do. And, some, and it's not always a bad thing to be desperate. It's not always a bad thing. It's not always a bad thing. Also, get this, it's not a bad thing to, to be a little fearful. It'll kind of get you ready and say, oh, well, and that's, again, we're looking at this biblical example and what happened, this great multitude that's coming, and I want to jump down to verse 3. We've already read it, just that first part, Jehoshaphat feared. Um, I mentioned this earlier, and I, I said, I remember, Karen, even whenever Miss Karen and I were dating, she had this verse of Scripture memorized, Psalm 56 and verse 3. Psalm 56 and verse 3 says, when I'm afraid, oh, what? Even online, you'll see it. Even online, you see what's in front of you. At times that I'm afraid, I will trust in you. And I thought that, you know, I heard, I did not memorize that verse. I've had several verses memorized as a teenager. And, uh, but Karen had that one memorized. And I said, I'm dating this girl named Karen Wilkes. And, and uh, she's got, and, and she quoted that. And she was talking about times where she was afraid. And she says, Michael, I love that verse, Psalm 56, verse 3. I says, what does it say? times that I'm afraid I will trust in thee. Trust in who? God. 
Trust in him when you don't know what to do. And that's exactly what happened. But the effect of that, that we have here at the end, verse 3, so he feared, but notice this. Now this is what's got to happen in your home, in your life, and in Sharon Missionary Baptist Church. He set himself. He made a determination. I, you know, you say, well, Brother Michael, I've really never fasted. Isn't that for like Jesus fanatics? Isn't that for like Jesus freaks? Isn't that for like some other religion? Baptists don't fast. We bring casseroles to church. Amen? That's why well, forget about fasting. I want a casserole at church. Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Baptists are known for their casseroles and desserts and the dessert table at Sharon Missionary Baptist Church in a fellowship is a mile long. And I thank the Lord for that. But it seems almost like it's a forgotten part in the Bible. And we're going to see later the example of Jesus in fasting and New Testament fasting and all that. You say, well, isn't, this, is go, this is like, oh, by the way, did you know this? This is like uh, putting your prayer life on steroids, okay? And steroids is good if your joints are aching, the good kind of steroids. You've got anabolic steroids where you can build muscle and all that. But you've also got steroids that will take away inflammation and pain. And, and it'll also help you grow and heal. Steroids can help you heal. And that's what our prayer life needs is healing and stepping up and putting it on steroids, so to speak. goes on, so he set himself and he, to seek the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judea and, <clears throat> or Judah. And looking at this, a lot of times whenever you take a step when you take a step of faith and say, I need to proclaim, you could proclaim it over yourself. You could proclaim it over your house and your home and said, we need to, to do some different things. We need to change direction as a house, as a marriage, as a family. You say, my marriage needs to be strengthened. My home needs to be strengthened. Our, our city, our country, our schools, our churches need to be strengthened. But he set himself, and by the way, as the king... Anytime you take a stand, and, and a lot of times pastors say, well, I'm going to preach on this and I'm going to preach on that. I feel led to, to, to lead the church in this direction. I feel led to take the church toward fasting. It, it always happens. It doesn't matter which way you lead. You can lead backwards, forwards, up or down. There's always going to be a complaint. There's always going to be a critic. There's always going to be somebody who doesn't like the way you tell somebody about Jesus and then I say, well, how are you telling people about Jesus? Well, I just, I don't really have a plan. Well, I'll stick with my plan because your plan doesn't sound very good, okay? And uh, so, so you say, but anytime you set yourself to and say, I'm going to seek the Lord and I'm going to be excited about the Lord. I'm going to tell others about Jesus and I'm going to tell the whole country. And he did. He told Judah, he said, come along with me. And did you know it called, well, he's the king. He's the king, and he could do that. And he said, let's get everybody together and let's pray because we're about to all die. That's pretty good motivation to me, okay? I remember whenever I became under conviction, I just thought you had to be more good than bad under conviction to be saved. And, I th and, I, and a Miss Audie Pounds started telling me the gospel story and then later on, she, she said, your mom, you need to talk to your mom about it. And, uh, and I, I knew I wanted to go to heaven and didn't want to go to hell. And mom told me, hey, do you realize what sin is, Michael? You realize you're a sinner? And I'm going to pray a prayer, then you pray a prayer. And I called on the Lord and asked the Lord to save me because I wanted to be with Jesus and I didn't want to go to hell. There's nothing wrong with being afraid because if it points, especially if it what? If it points you toward God and points you toward him. Back to our text in verse 4, this is what happens. Guess what happened? Judah gathered herself together to ask help from the Lord. And they gathered together and they sought the Lord. They came to seek the Lord. And I want to say this, no matter whether they're, you know, when you're desperately seeking the Lord, when you want to tell others about the Lord, and even though you're afraid, at times that I'm afraid, I will trust in you. And you say, I'm, I'm going to seek him. It's always right to do the right thing. Amen. And so many times our country... <sighs> 
there's, there's a gray area where our, we're losing and we're, we're, our churches have lost. we become comfortable. We got air conditioning. I praise the Lord for these bright lights. We got uh, carpet. We got uh, fine furniture, cushion, posturepedic pews to sit on, and we got all of this nice stuff, and I praise the Lord for AC on a hot July day. But we've become so comfortable that we, we've lost our oomph. We've lost our want to, to desperately seek God. One day, if we're not careful, we're going to lose our freedoms. We're going to find chains on Sharon Missionary Baptist Church doors. And we won't be able to come to you say, well, that'll never happen. It's happened in history. It's happened a lot of places in history. And you say, well, and even right now, churches are meeting underground. Well, that's okay. I can tell you what, if it becomes against the law, it's, it's still your choice. I mean, we'll meet over at Lance's house. We'll meet at Randy's house. We'll meet at somebody's house. We can still have church, amen? We may have to go underground. You say, well, that's silly. The preacher, that'll never happen. It's happening today. There's Christians that are hiding today, and they meet in houses and homes because it's against the law. They're protecting their kids. It's great to see all the kids that are here this morning, and I pray that you're, you know, you're engaged, and you listen. You listen to your parents, your grandparents, and you, just, and you say, okay, because listen, did you know that, uh, and we'll have discussion questions. There's discussion questions that'll be tagged at the end of this message on Facebook, and there's discussion questions, those same ones that are in the bulletin, in the electronic bulletin. And again, if you have any problem with that, see one of us staff members say, where's the electronic bulletin? I don't know where this thing is. And we'll help you find it. And you can even take your phone, if you have a smartphone, and hold it that that QR code, that thing of Bob out there, if you don't know what that is, ask anybody in here 16 and under. They'll show you a QR code. And, uh, so, and you go up there and those discussion questions, you literally become, to your kid, your grandkid, you are the teacher, the pastor for your family. Okay? Okay? And so I'm, I'm the under-shepherd under Jesus and shepherding this church and leading this church to, and so what do we need to do here in July, Sharon Church? We need to become desperate for God. You say, we ought to already be desperate for God. True, but we're not because we don't see any fruit of desperation anywhere. Move on to the next verses. And so this fast, and he proclaimed a fast. There was a call for a fast, and he's got it going on. And let's see what happens in this goal, verse 6. And taking off here, verse 6 says this. And what you're going to see is, number one, in verse 6, we're just move pretty fast in this goal. And so... Uh, Jehoshaphat says this, O Lord God of our fathers, you are, aren't you God in heaven? You, don't you rule over all the kingdoms of the nation? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? In other words, what fasting does is you're going to say, who am I fasting for? You're fasting for the Lord. He's your motivation. And guess what? You're going to recognize who God is. Is and you're going to also recognize what God can do and has done. Look at verse 7. Aren't you the God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and you gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? Basically, I want to ask you this morning, all of you, has God been good to you? You can say amen. amen. There you go. God has been good to you. He's blessed you. And that's all Jehoshaphat's saying. And even if you're, somebody says, well, Brother Michael, I've got cancer. Brother Michael, I've got sickness. Brother Michael, I've got this wrong with me. Brother Michael, I'm, I, I just lost my job. Brother Michael, I've, this has happened in my life. And yet we are tr still truly blessed. We live in a land where you can lose a job and get paid for it. <laughs> And to be at home. <laughs> and you, there's it's a great land. Yes, it's got tons of problems. Yes, there's social problems, economic problems, all kind of problems in our country today. But I'm thankful that we are here and we have this opportunity. Let's don't squander our freedom. Let's don't take it lightly or take it for granted of what we have here. And so he is praying and he's saying, you're a great God and I, I know what you've done for us. And I'm, I know you are. 
you can handle this problem that we have in front of us. Verse 9 is to resolve that we stay the course and not lose heart. If disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence. By the way, you are here. And I thank the Lord for those that are joining us online. Thank you for being here and shouting amen and praise the Lord in our comment box and answering. And I'm glad that people can be gone on vacation. It's a privilege to be able to broadcast our services and thousands of other churches are doing the same thing. And so I ask you again, he's counting it a privilege to go to the temple. And we should count it a privilege to go into this church building and to have the freedom that we do. And so he, he's saying that, and by the way, he's saying that we know you've got this. And we cry out to you at the end of verse 9, it says, and we cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. Skip down to verse 12, which is one of the main key verses for this morning. One of the main key verses, verse 12. Oh, our God, and this is Jehoshaphat, he's still speaking. Will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude. Let me pause right there. So there may be somebody in this room or somebody watching by Facebook and you feel like you are, you're helpless, that you don't know. And that's what he's about to say. You're, we feel like we've got this great multitude. We have no power I don't feel like I have the strength that is coming against us, verse 12. And look at this key part of verse 12. Nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Hence the title, and it's right there on the screen, it's right there on the screen for our Facebook uh, uh, crew and our Facebook congregation. There may be somebody here. And the title for this morning's message is what? Fasting when you don't know what to do. <laughs> Maybe there's uh, some husbands in here who, who are perfect husbands, but I'm not one of them. <laughs> Maybe there's some awesome, awesome husbands in here. Throughout the years, I don't know how many years, it took a lot of years Karen would come to me griping and complaining, usually about something that I've done or haven't done, forgot to do. And, uh, but anyway, it's generally it's a problem at work or a problem with the kids or a problem. And, uh, but she would come to me with a problem. Well, the man in me, I heard the problem. It took her 40 to 60 seconds to state the problem, but I had the problem solved in 30 seconds. I did. And then I immediately told her the answer to the problem and could fix everything in her life. And that made her even more upset and more angry. And I thought, how did that not compute and mess? And why, did I, why am I still messing up? And why am I still in hot water? I realized after a decade of marriage or maybe two that she did not want me to fix the problem. She just wanted me to listen to the problem, okay? And, uh, and so, but, you know, men, we can fix things in 30 seconds flat. And, you know, give me a screwdriver and bailing wire and duct tape, and I can fix anything, okay, and just bring it on. But, and I found out that a lot of times whenever you have problems, and again, what's the title for the message? Fasting when you don't know what to do. Sometimes God just wants us to become desperate for him and stop and listen. And sometimes that was the biggest recipe for a smoother marriage is for the husband anyway, and speak, picking on myself, is for me not to try to fix everything at once, but to just hit the pause button, stop and listen to my wife. Because she still had another 18 minutes of description left to go <laughs> on the description of the problem. And it made marriage a whole lot better when I was willing to listen more instead of just trying to fix things immediately. It's solved, and sometimes that's the way we should be with God and just trying to uh, just, hey, I need a, uh, a number three, Brother Michael, supersize and quick. Give me the sermon, and uh, I've already read your points, and I'm out of here in 18 minutes flat. 
Well, you're not going to be out of here in 18 minutes flat. Moving on after verse 12, we don't know what to do in verse 13. We reaffirm this together. Now all Judah with their little ones and their wives and their children stood before the Lord. And sometimes that's what's wrong with America. And I think I stated this earlier, but I'll repeat it again. As our churches go, so goes our country. And if we will not stand before the Lord with our kids and our grandkids, if we will not, and I know you say, well, Brother Michael, I, I, I raise my kids in church. I, I, I try to bring my grandkids to church. And, but sometimes, and it's important that we not give up and we stay the course. Our kids and our grandkids need to be with us. But more importantly, even if our kids and our grandkids won't come to church, instead of just lecturing them and taking a Bible and beating them over the head with the Bible, and I'm borrow this for an illustration, and just, and just saying, hey, listen to me when I'm talking to you. And so many times we want to browbeat our, our kids and our grandkids with the Word of God instead of just loving them and saying, I don't care if you're in a car, pull over on the side of the road in a safe spot and say, let's pray right now. And lead by example, whether you're in the church house, the house, or the schoolhouse. Be the example where you are the same kind of solid Christian no matter what building you're in. And so many times, that's what that verse 13 says. The whole family is together. The whole family and the family that can pray together, a family that can worship together, a family that can even go through where the whole family doesn't know what to do. But guess what the whole family is doing? Seeking the Lord. We don't know what to do, Brother Michael. It's okay. Where are your eyes? Or I should be on Jesus. I mean, be real before your family. Smack, thank you for letting me use your Bible. Okay. All right, I'm grabbing that thing. All right, moving on. And so you reaffirm this together, and finally, in closing and wrapping this thing up, verses 14 through 18, the effect of this uh, guidance, there was this fellow, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, and he, he was a Levite, and he began to speak, and he goes on to speak in verses 15 uh, through 18, and man, he's just speaking, and he says two times in verse 15 and verse 17, a key phrase that's probably the equivalent, verse 12 is cool, but verse 15 and 17 are more cool. And you know what 15 and 17 says? The battle is not, you know, oh, Hayden's going to hunt part, you're going to find it. The battle's not yours, but God's. And he says, so don't be afraid, don't be dismayed, for the battle's not yours. That's verse 15 but God's. Verse 17, you will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves. Stand still. Whoop, wait a second. Didn't Brother Michael talk about that earlier? <laughs> Being still. This happens to be in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Being still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. Do not fear. Don't be dismayed. For the Lord, he is with you. And matter of fact, if you keep reading verse 18, man, they started worshiping. They started praising God. And he said, guys, and, and Jehaziel and Jehoshaphat, and they got the word. They said, you need to go up and the, and the enemy is coming. And there's millions of them. I don't know exactly how many, but there's a bunch of them. And they're coming. They said, and he tells them, go up to this mountain pass. If you read the rest of the story. And they start singing on the way up there. I won't, give me a grenade launcher, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a mini 14, give me something. I want something for this army. You're leading us in singing and I, I want a bazooka. There's an enemy coming. It's kind of like the Battle of Jericho. March around the city in, in silence and what? What? You will not win a battle that way. But they did. So they go up to the mountain pass. While that's all going down, God causes the enemy to turn on themselves. And they end up killing each other. Be still, fast and pray. 
Don't just fast. A biblical fast is always combined with fasting and praying. Most of the time we say pray and fast, but I'm putting the emphasis on fast. Why is Brother Michael again preaching on this? Because I feel led to call ourselves to become desperate for God. To, to lead Sharon Missionary Baptist Church. And, and I don't care if the whole church ignores me, if two or three people would pray and fast, things change. That's the power of prayer. When just two or three people, you say, well, I'd love for two or three hundred. Amen. I would love for two or three hundred. I mean, give me two or three who, I mean, uh, give me two or three people who are, who are fired up for the Lord, desperate for him, who will charge hell with a water pistol and tell the devil to go sit on it and say, God, I am yours. I want to be with you. I want to serve you and be desperate for him. That's what I want. And I know that's what God wants. But too many people are scared of the devil and they shake in their boots when society and all we can do is complain and gripe about our country is going to hell in a handbasket or this or that and this or that. And all we can do, and, and we don't become desperate for him. We don't become desperate for God and desperate for, for all the things that have lost. The, the Bible says in, in Psalm 9, verse 17, and the nations, all nations that forget God shall be turned to hell. I don't want to be a nation or a church or a city or a county that forgets God. And we're just going through the motions. Our cities, our country, our churches, our pastors, our families, our marriages, and our children desperately need our prayers. All of this. And one way to take the next step is to fast, is to bow before God. I hope and pray this morning. Maybe there's somebody in here and you need to make a decision for the Lord. I'm going to be hanging out after church. I'll be hanging out. Come visit with me. I'm a phone call, a text away. Whether you're online or whether uh, you're here today, just, just let us know what, how we can serve you. The new electronic connect card that we've got, and we'll have, uh, there's a big QR code in the foyer, and we'll have some in the pews later where you can just hold up your phone camera and you can put in a prayer request. Again, we got the paper and all this and trying to be safe and sanitized and all this, but I'm letting you know that no matter your prayer this morning, no matter your desperation this morning, no matter what decision you're facing this morning, it's okay to fall on your knees and say, God, I don't know what to do. If King Jehoshaphat can say those words, it's okay for us to say it because look what happened. You know why he said that? He was desperate. And so I, I say before you and before the Facebook audience, it's okay to be desperate. It's okay to be afraid. Just turn to the Lord this morning. Father.